that we continue and we always you know, listen and, and listen to other people because even something so simple as the never sliding bodhisattva, what he did, even something so simple, it could mean some, something so profound. So I think it's something that it's a wonderful that we have this opportunity that we could share together and we can learn together. Okay, so um, today uh, we're uh, continuing on for our Lotus uh, Sutra review. And once again, we're still on chapter 20, which is Never Sliding Bodhisattva, the stories of this Bodhisattva. And I think it's very, um, it's very fitting. Um, in the past few weeks, we've been sharing about the setting, about the background information about this time period, about, um, about the three ages of Buddhism, what they are, how are they formed, and what can we do about it. That was two weeks ago. We shared this two weeks ago about the three ages of Buddhism, right? The age of right Dharma, the age of Zemplin's Dharma, and the age of degenerate Dharma. And all these three ages, what are they? How can we know what they are? What masters say they are? And how are they formed? Master actually explained to us how they're formed. And most importantly, what are we going to do about it? Okay, so this is, the, this is, the, uh, this is what Master said. Master said that, during this time, okay, everything is changing. The Dharma, the practice, and the Sangha, everything is changing. However, there is this person whose name is Never Sliding Bodhisattva. He, during this time of crisis, tried to reintroduce Buddha Dharma to the world. So this is what happened, right? You have all these things changing. Practice is changing. The Sangha is changing. The, the, the teachings didn't change, but people are changing. What happened? It's a crisis. It's a crisis where you don't know where to, how to stop it. It's like a, 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 a train slowly going down the slope and you, there's no break. You don't know how to stop it. So there is one bodhisattva, there's one um, monastic monk that his name is never sliding. And what did he do? This is his story. Okay. So what did he actually do and why? Well, whenever you saw any monk, this is last week, oh, we're just going to review of what we said last week, right? Whenever he saw any monk, non layman, laywoman, he would go and praise them and pay homage to them and say, I deeply respect you because all of you will become Buddhas. Not only that, he would do this. He did not concentrate on reciting the sutras, but he did all this. He was prostrating whenever he saw anyone, right? So if it's from very far away, he would go up to them and praise them and do all this because he said, you will all become Buddhas. Not only that, people would you know, scold him, people will belittle him, but he still does it. He still does all of this, okay? And he didn't stop, okay? And not only that, people would attack him, sticks and stones. He would just flee and then from afar and say it loudly at a distance, at a safe distance, he says, you will all become Buddhas. So this is what he did. In the time of crisis for Buddhism, there is this person and this is what he did. Last week, we talked about why. This is what he did in the sutras, but the sutra didn't tell us why. So last week, we talked about master through different days explaining why he did this through various ways because everyone is family. Whoever is older is like our parents. Whoever is younger, they are like our brothers and sisters. And in fact, if you believe in in the Fu Mu and Zhong Nan Bao Jing, if you believe, if you, if you, if you chanted, if you have recited this sutra before, or if you have seen the performance, you know that all of us, all of these people that we might know or we might not know, maybe in the previous lifetimes, they are our parents. And if you believe that, then with such mindset, then you, you must be very respectful. Then you would understand why never sliding bodhisattva always always, always would prostrate and bow to everybody and treat everyone with, with respect because, because everyone is our parents from previous lifetime. Therefore, we must respect them. So that was one reason why we do this. Then on the next day, Master gave us even different reasons because of compassion, because of compassion. They hit him with sticks, throw stones and bricks. He still thinks highly of them because why? Because without these actions to test the resolve, to grind the pride, you would not know how much cultivation you have done. You would not know how far away are you from completing, from perfecting 
your motivation. You will know. It's almost like, thank you, hurricane. Thank you, storm, to bring all the rainwater to let me know where the leak is in my home. This is a very different type of, of changing your mindset. So this is on the second day. So every day, last week we talked about, every day master gives us something different to explain why never studying bodhisattva did this, right? So another, another day on the 18th, master said that, that there's always a teacher among us. This teacher might teach you or this teacher might not teach you. And the teacher that does not teach you and show you the very negative things, you, that's also your teacher because they show you how not to be. Therefore, you must always be respectful. Okay, so that's, this is all from last week. I'm just going through this very quickly, okay, because we have this week's content too. So Never Study Bodhisattva is, is to remind all the practitioners that we must not give up so easily. Remember that. This is your vow. This is our vow. This is our vow to deliver all sentient beings. Don't quit. Don't stop just because people shout, scold at you, belittle you. You continue, right? So once again, this is our vow. Stick to it. This attitude is very, very important. That's why he persisted. Okay, he re remained respectful even if he was yelled at, he was yelled at, he was scolded, he was belittled. It does not matter. Okay, so on the very, on the very same day, always Master gave us another reason that we bodhisattvas do not pick and choose our our responsibility. This is our vow. We don't pick and choose because this is easier, so I pick. That's harder, so I don't. No, because this is in front of me right now, and that's why I am doing this. There's an affinity. With, regardless of how difficult it might be, we are always prepared to do this. They don't choose which one is better or easier. They don't pick which one is better or ripen. They go just because they are needed. Okay, and. The, the whole thing is, even if the words of the sutra keep on repeating, Master continue with different explanations. Because Master was afraid that after hearing it for the third time, we will all fall asleep and go like, yeah, I heard this before. Why? Because Master does not want us to become disrespectful of the sutra. You know, if you read the sutra, you're going to realize that it's just an old man repeating himself. That's a very disrespectful way to look at it. But if you look at it, that's what it is. So Master is trying to show us today, today in the morning Dharma talk, Master is still talking about the most important thing is sincerity and the respect for the Sangha, for the Dharma, and for the Buddha. How could you show respect if you keep on thinking it's all just repeating? So Master try to connect us and say, yes, the words are repeating, but it's actually very different meanings. So she continued on with different explanations so that we are continued hooked onto the explanations. Because if it's the same thing for over three days, you're not going to come back for the fourth day. You're just going to be thinking it's all going to be the same. So for all these days, it's all going to be different explanations about why. And it all made sense. You know, it's like, it's like trying to convince somebody to become vegetarian. Right? You tell them it's because it's for environmental purposes. It's for human natural resources, right? uh, natural resources. It's talking about health reasons. It's talking about religious. It's talking about compassion. It's talking about equal equality of life. All these are right, but it depends on who you're talking to. You're going to pick and choose the right tools to fit that person. So infinite Dharma doors. Infinite Dharma doors. There's so many, so many different ways you can go about this. One repeating sentence, I'm not going to belittle you, you're going to be Buddha. But so many reasons behind, so much wisdom. How is that possible? Because Master had already experienced it all. Because Master had already explained this in various ways. You know, if, you are, if you're in conflict with somebody else and Master try to come in and say, well, you know, don't fight, don't fight. Well, look at him. He's much older than you. He's like your father. Respect him like your father, okay? All right. That's what Master did, talking about never sliding, right? Well, look at this. He's like a test for you to see if you are ready and prepared. Are you prepared? Did you fail or did you pass? There you go. So 
all these things actually correspond to what Master had already explained for us. The reason why infinite Dharma doors appeared in front of us is because Master had already walked these paths. Master had already explained this in various settings to all of us. That's why all these sounded so familiar. Because in other times, we've already heard this story already. Okay, so now going to this week, and it's already 7.17, okay? So we spent half the time explaining what we talked about in the past two weeks, three weeks. So this week, we can talk about deeper insights. It's no longer just about the setting, about the greater scope of things. It's talking about, and, and not just talking about what the never studying Bodhisattva did and why. Now we're talking about the deeper insights. With the setting done, explaining done, now we can go into the, the deeper insight. And that's what Master is doing. Why is it every day slowly, slowly paving the way? Is because you want to reach to the deeper insights. But before you get there, you need to pave the road. Slowly, I pave it here today. And then tomorrow I come back, I'm going to walk on the path that I paved on, and I'm going to pave more. And until you are all paved, you can walk on this path to the deeper insights. So what are they? So on the 24th, Master talks about, never studying Bodhisattva persisted in his actions. Whenever he sees anyone, he would prostrate and show respect. And we know this. Okay, we know this. Because there's nothing else in his mind, only this. In his mind, he's truthfully and genuinely sincere. Respect everyone. There's nothing ingenuine about it. I like to, when I read this in Chinese, I was very moved because I never thought of it this way. For never studying Bodhisattva, there's only one thing that he does. Sometimes we think people are simpletons. You only know how to do one thing. But imagine, for never studying Bodhisattva, there's so much wisdom behind this, but he only does one thing. One thing only. Does that remind you of somebody? Yeah. Master said in, in her life, she only does one thing, and that was Ziji. Yes, behind Ziji, there's so many things, but it's just exactly the same. Behind the bowing, there are so many things going on here. Treating them like my parents, treating them like my teacher. This is a test for me. I need to, this is my work. This is my homework. I do not pick and choose work. This is what I need to do. This is my affinity. I am planting good seeds. All these things, right? Nothing else in the mind, only this. So on the 25th or of, of, of morning Dharma talk, um, never citing Bodhisattva continue his action and cultivation with, with this utmost urgency and vigor. He continued diligence. Starting with the age of right Dharma, he began to listen. He listened to the Buddha, learn and practice, right? He, li he listened to the awesome sound um, Buddha, the teachings, right? And in the age of semblance Dharma, he continued his conviction. He didn't, he, not because people begin to change, he didn't stop. Not because people begin to change and the Dharma and the Sangha and the practice begin to change, he didn't stop. He continued, he held. He protected the, gar the Dharma. He held on to the right Dharma that's in his mind while everything around him is changing. He protected it. And then he guided others to understand the true Dharma. Remember, reintroduce because people had lost their ways. They had forgotten. So he had to guide them to reintroduce them what true Dharma is. Even in the age of re degenerate Dharma, he continued. So he did all of this. He continued with this vigor, with this conviction. And that was Bodhisattva path. And, and, and everything I hear here, everything I, this is all from master, right? And I'm summarizing it. But whatever that, all these things that you just saw, this is all Dharma talk from, from master. And I am thinking the reason why master can 
just like faucet. You turn the faucet on and the water keeps on coming out. The reason why master kept on coming out, even if it's a very short, slight segment from the sutra, it's because this is her. She is exactly doing this. She is the embodiment of never citing bodhisattva because never citing bodhisattva is the embodiment of the bodhisattva path, right? Diligence, one single path, always moving forward. This is what Master said, what diligent is. Very single, one objective. There's nothing else, just one. And always moving forward, never backing down. This is Bodhisattva path. This is diligence. This is Master. This is never studying Bodhisattva. What else? Sincerity. Remember? Remember the um, sincerity? Remember, Master said, with utmost sincerity, we vow to deliver all sentient beings. This is to, um, this is to um, put together sincerity, and four encompassing vows. This is what Master is talking about. Because in the minds of the, of the never studying Bodhisattva, there's utmost sincerity, right? So, continue. On the 24th, the, the Dhamma talk, Master said, regardless of how others reacted to, the, to never sliding bodhisattva and what the, their attitudes are, never sliding bodhisattva would just endure it all. But it's not even tolerance or endurance. It just is. If you have to endure or tolerate it, that means you're upset or unhappy about what others did. Master said, you have to reach a state where it's not endurance where it's not forbearance, it's not tolerance. You are enduring it so that you don't have to endure it. So the ultimate forbearance is no need for forbearance because you already accepted it. You already understood it. And this is exactly all those things are, right? People are scolding you. People are saying things and you're thinking, what if this were my father? What if this were my mother? What would I do? What if this were my teacher? I treat him like my teacher. You are teaching me something. Changing your mindset. You are enduring the hardship. And then you change your mindset. You, be you become one of grat gratefulness because you realize, you know, I think he's like my father. Or I think he's like my teacher. He's teaching me something. Am I getting it? Or am I just being angry? Or am I enduring it? No, I am learning. And because you are learning, you truthfully are grateful. That's a true change. And when you're truthfully grateful, when you're sincerely grateful, then there is no endurance. And that's what Gan Yuan Zuo Huan Xi Shou is. Because when you're so willing, there is no need to endure. If you're so willing, you're not, you're not like, I'm enduring my time to spend with my children. No. You are enjoying your time. You're not enduring your time. You're enjoying your time. And because you're enjoying your time, there is no endurance. It's just about, it just is. So, Master is trying to take us to the next level, right? Bodhisattva path is about persistence. It's about endurance. But it's about the next level, which is there's no need for endurance and forbearance because you accepted it, because you are grateful. Because you change your mindset to be able to look beyond the surface. So we talked about sincerity. We talk about diligence. And then we talk about forbearance and all of this. But what happens when we couldn't just normalize it? What happens when we couldn't just say, yeah, he's like my father, but I still want to shout. What happens? What happens when you say, Thank you, teacher. I know you're my teacher, but I still hate you. What happens when all these things fail? What happens? And that happens all the time, right? You know, masses show, show us all the tools, all the right tools. And we try to use them, but we don't know how. Or we misuse it, right? Think of them as our friends. Think of them as our family. Think of them. This is a test for you. Don't fail. And then you fail. This is a test to grind your pride. And then your pride sprung up. This is a test. Bodhisattva, do not choose and pick. And then you quit here and then you pick something easier. 
We fail all the time. So what happens when we couldn't just use the tools to get beyond? What happens? And this happened to never studying Bodhisattva. This happened. So on the 25th, Master said, never studying Bodhisattva had done this for a very long time. And he continued to receive this respect from all. He felt that it has been many, many years that his time is up and the affinity is done. It is time to depart. I'm done, you know? I've done everything I can. I've done everything that was taught of me. I am done. So at this time, what is he? He's in the age of semblance. He's calling it quits. I couldn't change these people. I'm doing everything that my teacher taught me to do. But I didn't get the final proof of evidence that, yes, you got it. Even never studying Bodhisattva hit this bottleneck. He was very joyous. He was treating everybody like their teacher, their parents, their family, treating everything like a test. He has to pass them. It's a mission. It's a responsibility. But one day, he couldn't take it, and he's called me a quit. Time to depart. At this time, amazing things happen. The words of reminder from awesome sound Buddha comes through the void. And all of a sudden, never sliding Bodhisattva is inspired again and reinvigorated. And I'm so touched. Why? Because if you remember back in chapter 10, the teacher of Dhamma, Buddha once said that if at any moment that there is a need, he will come. And in chapter 11, something did came. The Buddha from the tower, the, the, the pagoda, did come and prove that whatever Buddha said is right. I am the proof. All we needed are words of reminder and encouragement. And it will come through the void. It will come through the air, come through the somewhere. And then it will get us going again and reinvigorate it. On the 26th, Master said, for a long, long time, never sliding Bodhisattva have followed this Buddha, sound, awesome, uh, awesome sound Bodhisattva, uh, Buddha, life after life, and had endured through three ages of Dharma, have gone through, followed a long time, very, very long time, and had gone through all these three ages of Dharma. So the awesome sound Buddha's voice and reminder will always and forever be in slight, never sliding Bodhisattva's life. And I'm thinking that this is exactly how, how it is for us. So is it real? Is it real? you bet it's real. And I think there's so many cases where maybe a Jin Si aphorism come up out of nowhere. Maybe the, the biggest story probably is, if you remember last year, um, our brother from Jordan, he had encountered a problem and he wanted to, he was not able to continue the medical mission because it was very difficult in Jordan, in the refugee camps. So he thought maybe it's time to call it quits. He would only um, focus on one part of Tsuji to help the refugees, but the other part he has to let, let go because he just couldn't handle it anymore. What happened? Yeah, you remember, yeah. He, dreamed, he dreamed of master. And what did master say? Master say that, in his, in, that if he couldn't do it, that Master was willing to use her blood, use her body to help, to continue. So he woke up from this dream. And then the next day, he hopped on the flight and come back to Taiwan and explain to Master. So is it real? It's very real. Because you have followed this teacher, just like Never Studying Bodhisattva have followed the awesome sound Buddha for life after life. Remember. Awesome sound Buddha, his age of 
right dharma is very, very long. And his age, his, the actual age, lifespan of this Buddha was very long too. So never studying Bodhisattva, followed, followed this teacher all this time, life after life. This is not just one lifetime, not just many years. This is life after life after life after life. Continue. So all this teaching, regardless of whether you understand, it's already seeds in you. So when it's ready, it will come out. Out of nowhere. It's not out of nowhere. It's out of, you're here. So Master keep on telling us, to what? To never forget that year. That was a call back. So that we always remember there's a seed there. And if you don't remember, it's time to plant it. You know how it's, you know, you, you walk out your room and then you put, you put your hand on your pocket. You make sure that you bring what you were supposed to bring. Yeah. If you check your pocket and you forgot your wallet, what do you do? You go back and you get your wallet. And if you check your pocket and the, and the wallet is there, you feel safe. You continue. That's what never forgetting that moment is about. It's an action to check your pocket. Did you still remember? If you remember, good. Go on. If you don't remember, now it's time to plant the seed because otherwise it will be too late because no one will be here to remind us. And that will be the voice to serve us as coming through the void. When you need a help, you will wake up one day, you will go to sleep and then you'll wake up, go like, oh my God, I'm so inspired. I'm going to continue to do this. So did it work? Yes, it did. Because after all this, he was re reinvigorated, he was inspired, and everybody looked at him and he was changed. He was no longer just the one like, I'm bowing to you. No, he was changed. And people began to follow, never studying Bodhisattva. So is it possible? It's very possible. It's very real. That's the deeper insights. So first we talk about the greater setting. We talk about what, is the three age, what are the three ages. Then we talk about why never studying Bodhisattva came. Because it was an age of crisis. Somebody needed to do something. And he came up. What did he do? He did something very simple. He only did one thing, but he never stopped. He persisted. Why did he do it? Many different reasons. He changed his mindset. Sometimes he would treat everybody like his parents. He would treat everybody like his teacher. He would know that this is a test to test his resolve, to grind his pride. He would know that all of this is his own vow. He didn't choose to do this. It was his own vow. And because it was his own vow, he was happily doing it. There was no regret. There was no remorse. There was no complaint. Even though it was hard, it was something that he has to do. That was what he did because he was guarding the Dharma. He was protecting the, guard, the Dharma. But when it came really difficult, the teacher came out, out of nowhere, out of his heart to remind him, this is your vow. Don't forget. And then he's reinvigorated again. And then the people that he thought was impossible to deliver, impossible to help, what did they do? They believed him. So sometimes, sometimes, a little more will, a little more strong strength will get us over that challenge. So thank you. That's my sharing for today. I apologize. I'm a little bit over time. Um, there's not enough time to go into the QA, but I'm going to stop right here. So hopefully we are going one step at a time, deeper and deeper into this Ben Man. It's not just never citing Bodhisattva story. It's so much bigger. It's about you and me. It's about how we have to be the age of right Dharma. It's about we have to overcome the, 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 the difficulties and changing our mindset. It's about we of how we can overcome. And when we are in trouble, what do we do? There are people and voices around us to carry us through. That's what this chapter is about. It's not just about that one person. It's about us. So thank you all. And hopefully we'll continue. Uh, but next week, uh, it should be time for a master to be on a trip. So I should not be available, but I'm hoping that we continue to listen to the Dharma because Master kept on explaining. And if you go deeper, it is so much more treasure. It's a treasure cove. Don't go in and come out empty handed. We have to put the time and effort into it. Reinvigorate it, re-inspired, reintroduce 
to how we understand Buddhism. Okay, thank you. Thank you. About masters, uh, brothers and sisters all over the world. Now tonight at the Kalana Jaya um, Center, we have a uh, we have a Jinsu aphorism sharing, and I have here with me Sister Vijaya. Sister Vijaya is from uh, Puchong um, Center, but today she's en route to uh, institutional visit in Batu Arang. So I'll give her time uh, for her to share on the Jinsu aphorism that she has chosen today. Sister Vijaya. Thank you, Sister. Good morning, Master, Master of Obor, brothers and sister. Today, the Jinsu aphorism that I would like to share is a wise person is able to let go. To let go is actually to receive, to receive boundless happiness. For me, this Jinsu aphorism very close to my heart where after I joined Suchi, I start to let go a lot of desires, my attachment, my sorrow, my pain. I remember when I lost my mother, um, passing of my pa parents, especially my mom, I have a great pain in me, uh, always uh, in uh, deep uh, Sorrow. So, but after I joined Suchi, after listening to Master, especially Ching Su Korizam, especially this uh, let go uh, met, I mean, information on letting go, I let go my pain and I started to accept that I have to, um, uh, I mean, let go my sorrows and accept as it is, things as it is. And I found once I let go all my pain, my sorrows, I become a very happy person. And um, for me, Cheng Se Aphorism is an easy and a simple way to understand Dhamma taught by Master and Buddha. And it's actually a life uh, wisdom that we can practice in day-to-day -day life. I think that's all from me, Tan An. Thank you, Sister Vijaya, for uh, this realization through uh, Jinsu aphorism. And uh, today, um, I think uh, we have in the background some uh, brothers and uh, some sisters here. We have uh, Tulasi and then uh, Kamala and uh, Mother Lechmi. And uh, the three of them are also joining Sister Vijaya to the, uh, um, the center, uh, a HIV center for the service there and they're going to do a dance there because yes. of Deepavali and uh, the Festival of the Light that's celebrated in Malaysia. So uh, good luck to you all and enjoy your time there. So without any uh, further ado, I will pass the next session which is the last session for today. today. Unfortunately, today Sister Julie wants to share but uh, due to time frame, we're going to pass the session to Brother Kevin. Brother Kevin, all yours on the Master Tuesday series, Chapter 9, yeah? Okay, all to you Brother Kevin. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Morning, brother and sister. Okay. Uh, first of all, I think um, very much uh, you know uh, appreciated for uh, brother Joe uh, for taking his time you know to share with us uh, you know at first of course the the Mandarin version and, and you know changing to the English version. <laughs> so I think it's 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 really a wonderful you know wonderful. Uh, uh, aspiration of uh, Brother Joe and of course uh, uh, Sister Siu Ching for inviting me for this sharing. So without further ado, I will just proceed. Uh, today I'm actually going to just touch on the episode 9 of uh, Master Tutor. Um, the key topic will be basically, uh, you know, seeing that the uh, beloved disciple at that moment was actually referring to Master Tutor, uh, spreading the Dharma and, uh, and both uh, his masters uh, uh, Definitely very happy to be the listener. Okay, so um, so at that moment, uh, Master Hui Si, uh, I'm not sure whether uh, all all of the uh, you know um, audience over here have actually got a chance to um, you know watch the drama. Uh, I think if not, then they'll be very much encouraged because uh, it's definitely a very well made and you know a profound drama, and we can actually learn a lot from that. Uh, it's a lot of application of uh, drama and also. Uh, uh, upholding the uh, Lotus Sutra. So Master Hui Si, uh, at that moment, um, decided to let other disciples follow and support uh, Sutra. 
Um, and also Master Hui Guang, the previous uh, master of uh, Master Tzu has also come and you know, uh, supported uh, Master Tzu Tzu. And, uh, and of course, both of them are very happy, you know, because uh, they, they, they were actually the teacher for Master Tzu Tzu. And, uh, and now, you know, the Master Tzu Tzu become, you know, the one who is responding and both the, the, the teachers are actually listening. So, um, yeah, this is uh, Master Hui Su, the teacher of Master Tzu Tzu at that moment. Um, and basically, uh, at that moment, um, Master Zhi Zhe has been approved or certified by Master uh, Hui Si. Uh, this actually reminds me of recently, I uh, think, in, in uh, you know, things about um, Master Chen Yan has also sort of, um, you know, uh, approved or certified um, the 32 uh, brother and sister, including Father Zhu, you know, uh, to be actually spreading the Dharma on behalf uh, of you know, uh, Master Chen Yan. So, um, and of course, coming back to Master Zhe Zhe, at that moment, he was very well learned about Dharani. I'm going to explain more about Dharani. And in fact, he, he was actually the best among the disciples. And no problem at all in responding to Dharma because and he has also attained the Samadhi. So, a uh, little bit on Dharanis. Um, there are actually three levels or three yeah, uh, steps of Dharanis. Uh, first is revolution, and second is 100,000 million, and also the third one is Yufu Dharma. Right. Revolution Dharani basically, uh, okay, first the word Dharani actually uh, means Dharma essence. It's like you can actually align that to our marrow or the, you know, uh, essence to keep, you know, our blood, uh, our body healthy. It's like blood circulation. So it's so important. And once we have attained the revolution Dharani, we'll be able to spread and apply Dharma in the world according to sentient beings' capabilities. And like doctor, uh, they're able to prescribe the correct medicine to cure illness. And also can turn around or shift the paradigm perspective for ordinary beings' attachment. This reminds me of, uh, you know, very thankful to Brother Cho again, of sharing us the different paradigms of perspective. You know, when we actually listen to, uh, you know, uh, Sangren's or Master Chen Yan's teaching in Lotus Sutra, you know, um, we can actually apply different thoughts and different way to try to actually, uh, you know, enlighten the, the uh, sentient beings, especially uh, all of us, in how do we uh, appreciate, you know, the chapter of uh, Never Sliding uh, Bodhisattva, uh, you, you, which you would actually treat, uh, you know, the others as either their parents or, you know, the the brother and sisters, or they could be the future Buddhas, or it is, could be an adversity that teaches us to be a become, you know, to cultivate ourselves to become a better Bodhisattva. So it's actually able to, you know, change the perspective of different people. I think in this perspective, uh, I must uh, commend uh, Father Joe able to do that, and you know, of course, representing uh, uh, Simon as well, and of course, understanding the principle of emptiness. Uh, but also have to understand that by being understanding the principle of emptiness, it doesn't mean that we have to give up everything. In fact, uh, we, we actually ought to be very diligent in growing our Dharma wisdom, which is the principle of uh, true emptiness, but wondrous assistance. Um, also another brother Huang and also brother Chris, if you are, they are actually very famous in, in uh, sharing Dharma, as well as Dharma. So it's also about perception, it's about turning. Turning is changing our, our perception and perspective. The second one is about 100,000 million revolution Dharani. What does it mean? Uh, why, okay, you know, in the Sutra, we always refer to a lot of numbers, you know, infinites and eons and all those times. So it's trying to refer to there are many things, you know, all the things in the world, in the time and space that we are in, uh, nothing is everlasting. Take the example of, uh, you know, we always say, do not forget, um, the year, the 921 earthquake. So, um, yeah, just an instant, the service of Chuchu pigs will just peel off. And um, like what masters always taught us, right? Uh, everything in the world, when there's a form, uh, there's a formation, assistant, decay, and there's a disappearance. Um, I've also quoted uh, previously the example of this glacier in, uh, in Ireland. You know, it's a 700 year old glacier, but, uh, you know, just in August this year, it became just nothing, disappeared. And also recently, just about two days ago, 
there's this uh, Japan Shuri Castle fire. So this castle was already 600 years old. And, you know, just over a night, it was all burned off. And also recently, uh, we have been talking about, hearing about a lot about Los Angeles fire. Uh, I mean, we all know, probably know about this guy. He's, he's the famous Arnold Schwarzenegger who acted in the Terminator. So in the movie, he was saving life, but uh, in real life, you see, uh, even how rich, you know, multi-million dollar, you know, uh, used to be the uh, interstate mayor of LA, also have to run away. So, so what we're trying to say is that, you know, whatever you see, you know, no, no matter how rich we are, um, you know, it is not, it's, it's all illusional end of the day. Yeah. So, so this is the second uh, Dalani, understanding that all are being actually just illusional. Right? And this is also what we call the all-encompassing wisdom, which you understand the principle of emptiness and also the truth of illusiveness. So we can see all this in what is happening in the world currently. Right? So the third one is a skillful Dharma Sound Dalani. Uh, it is what we call the middle way. So we, we do not want to be just attached to emptiness and also we do not want to be attached to, you know, uh, uh, there's a form, there's always, you know, uh, assistance. So we would like to choose the middle way so that we are able to, you know, freely uh, use skillful means to, to switch between, you know, the, the both and also try to educate the sentient beings, you know, with the, the correct path and the correct way. So uh, what we're trying to say is that we would like to actually be very proactive, you know, very proactive and also seize the moment and walk the Bodhisattva path with the legion. Okay, coming back to Master Tzu-Tzu. Um, so, um, so Master Tzu-Tzu at that moment was giving lecture and the other disciples are supporting. So this is what I think, uh, you know, um, Simon would like us to do as well. Uh, like what Master Chen has uh, actually, you know, certified Brother Joe and also uh, assigned Brother Joe to support Six Chuxin to grow a uh, Sin Fa Xiang group. So what we need is we need affinity to, in, you know, in spreading the Dharma. So at that moment, of course, we have all the uh, other, uh, what we call Dharma Master also supporting. And here now, we also have, uh, you know, our very beloved English group, you know, supporting. Uh, this is uh, the picture of them in, uh, you can see some familiar faces there, you know, supporting each other. So working with one another in unity. This is what Master always wants us to do in unity with mutual love and concerted effort. Right? So, uh, and this definitely will help boost Master's energy the most. Okay, coming back to master, uh, this episode. Um, so at that moment, um, Master Tzu Tzu was, uh, you know, being assigned and also certified and he's going to actually speak to the public, right? Uh, so everyone is gathering over there. So, and at that moment, of course, Master Kui Guang, the previous uh, teacher of um, Master Tzu Tzu also came all the way to, to uh, you know, listen to him. And uh, the were audience were asking, sounds weird, you know, master listen to his disciple. It's like student li listening to the teacher. So then uh, Master Hui Kuang uh, humbly said, wow, uh, you know, master can be student and, and student can be master. You know, we learn from each other. And uh, in fact, we are connecting in one circle of life. You know, why not? So, so this is also um, what we also understand, the, you know, the, the situation, what we, what we see, the situation of in reincarnation. And we are all actually determining back with great wow, you know. These are all uh, Bodhisattva in the past and, you know, they are coming back to actually uh, try to transform and deliver and explain Dharma to more people. Right? So these are the two masters, you know, the current master and the previous master of uh, the teacher of uh, Master Tzu So they are having, they are very humble and very selfless and, you know, almost you can like that to the spirit of never sliding Bodhisattva. Of course, they are both master and, and there will be more respect towards each other. Uh, but even with that, uh, of course, um, there are also others. Because during the episode, there are also other Dharma masters who were not uh, paying respect to uh, Master Tzu at that moment, who was being very young. So, um, so I think for that, uh, we have also learned from uh, today's uh, masters uh, teaching that you know, we, we should never be uh, you know, underestimating anyone who, who actually the potential uh, Buddha in the future. So, uh, reflection. Um, so, what this chapter is actually teaching us is that 
uh, it's like what master is teaching us as well, you know, when, when actually during the morning assembly on Saturday, every Saturday. So um, master is also encouraging uh, the disciples to actually share the Dharma, like what uh, master uh, Brother Joe share and also Siu Ching and all the other sisters. So um, I think that is what uh, master is trying to encourage us to also want us to not just listen, but also able to spread the Dharma on a behalf. Um, so in the chapter itself, it's mentioned that at that moment, we know it's very difficult to actually, it's not like a technology era at us that we have all the technology to save our information. So they even have to transcribe the sutras and go in. Why? In order to pass down for ages to come. You know, like not, right now we have the books, the videos and TV and all those things. But what is more important as uh, already pointed out by uh, Brother Joe is that what are more important are the people meaning all of us, all of us, you know, the disciples, that we have to be very diligent in, in expounding the Dharma. Because if we just have the Dharma, the wordings, you know, the books and the videos, and even transcribed in the going, if there's no one spreading it, and, you know, after hundreds of years, um, you know, it will be still be degenerated. So always remember, yeah, we are the most important um, people in in the Dharma. So reflection, um, how should we, uh, Chiji volunteers, pass on the Dharma forever? So of course, continuously, we, we, we come to Simfa Siang, we share, we do, we share, and of course, storytelling, uh, which is also very important, but like this morning, uh, Master shared about the, uh, there's one, uh, you know, a lay practitioner from, from, from Changtun, you know, uh, so, and there's also one uh, brother from US, uh, who actually went all the way to Changchun to, to uh, sort of uh, verify that it was true that, you know, the, the volunteers in Changchun really, you know, uh, went through all the hardship to come to, you know, Chin Fa Jia. I think all this life story is very inspiring, you know, that will actually make people remember even better. So I think we should use this way to actually uh, also share uh, the Dharma. And of course, uh, we also need to go to the mass and recruiting more people, not just listening, but doing as what uh, Brother Joe uh, pointed today. So only by doing, we are able to actually um, so-called test, so-called testify, you know, whatever we have learned, we have here, uh, whether it is true, you know, it, like the spirit of uh, never sliding to side. If you're only going to the mass, only we can actually feel, you know, how, uh, you know, are we already cultivating? Are we actually living up to the, you know, spirit or not? And of course, finally, we need to always make great vows, like what, uh, you know, uh, Sangren used to say that making great vows are more difficult than moving Mount Sumeru. Uh, but really, kudos to Sis Chuchin Brothers uh, Joe in leading us and also all brothers and sisters in growing in English group, you know, from one to infinity, the spirit of. Um, so always remember about also uh, this brother Chris, when, when he was just 11 years old, he, he already made the vow, you know, when uh, this brother is asking him that when are you ready to speak the Dharma, he says, now, now is the time. So every moment is the time that we should seize the opportunity and speak the Dharma. So uh, last but not least, uh, I would like to quote this uh, you know, saying by Master Chuchu. Uh, he says that in the light of Dharma, if the light of Dharma can be passed down, then the brightness it expels will light up the darkness of the Monday world. I think this is what very much leaded in this current uh, era of uh, Dharma degeneration. Right, Kanan. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brother Kevin, so much. I'm, I'm very impressed uh, and very thankful because um, you have um, tied, it's just one episode, okay? One episode, you're able to gain so much. And I think this is, um, this is the meaning, and I really believe this, right? Master said, the, uh, the Bodhisattva of mercy, Guan Yin, Guan Xin Pu Sa. Um, it's not just about 1,000 hands, right? It's also 1,000 eyes. Watching the same episode, 500 people with 1,000 eyes would have different ideas. And the most important thing is we have different ideas and different perspectives. How do we um, gain that perspective and share and so, that one of, so that 500 people seeing different things will now be put together and become one? So this is going the other way. It's not from one to infinity. 
it's to in, it's from infinity coming back to one so that we all feel the same way and we all slowly understand because as i was going through um the um brother kevin's uh, presentation you know he was very spot on with um every key point about what is darani and what is revolution what is the you know hundred thousand million and and explaining through it all plus the different examples and i i was very impressed so um, that is very important and thank you for uh, keep on referring back to what master had said and what we have shared It was about the people, you know, we are the it, it, it's not the Dharma that's going to pass on on its own It's the people that have to pass on this Dharma and it's through something like this through this sharing through your doing the work because you have to share so you took on the work so other people can hear and listen and see and then it becomes ours. And I think it's something that, um, but then you gain the most. And I think this is the whole point about the Bodhisattva path is that you had to persist. You're going to hit some snags. You're going to be, there's going to be some difficulties, but you had to persist. And ultimately you gain, we all gain. But um, feeling gratefulness is, is very important and feeling that sincerity. And, and because we made the vow to do it, nobody forced us to do it. And, and, I don't think Sister Xiao Qing forced you to do this. Yeah. I hope not. I certainly, I certainly hope not. So, um, and all of us, we're doing this not because anyone forced us to, because we know we need to do this and we should and we want to. So even though it's difficult, there's still sweetness in it. There's no bitterness. And that's the utmost sincerity. And that's what Never Sighting Bodhisattva was, was, Master was trying to tell us that truthfully feel that gratefulness and feel that sincerity that you see the feelings of Master Zizhe, of why he's doing this, of Master Hui Si, why he's trying to let his own disciples do this, why they were happy when the disciples outshine the teacher. Can you be happy if, you know, you are the Zizhen and then someone who was just certified last year, you know, became all of a sudden much better than you. They are talking about him and not you, even though you are the reason why they came in. Would you be happy? It would be very difficult because you would be like, well, without me, he wouldn't be doing this, right? So, so most of us, we're still ordinary beings, but you look at them. Can you truly be sincerely happy and not just be like, yeah, I'm happy for you, but you don't really are. You're not really happy. Yeah, I'm grateful, but you're not really grateful. So that's what age of semblance Dharma is again, right? So, so all these things are tied together, always together. And that's why I think it's so, it's so helpful, you know, uh, to share this lastly, um, I know time is eight o'clock already. Um, uh, uh, I did, I, while I was preparing my slides, um, if you, if you were in a Chinese session, I broken down into seven different parts of perspectives and I used it on my own. I used it. I really, when I hit last week, I hit a major problem and someone was really giving me a lot of tests. <laughs> And, and I really use those seven different perspectives. You know, I, I, I yeah. think of this and nobody forced me to do this. Yeah. I made my vow to, to do this. Yeah. So why am I complaining? This is my own vow. So if you put it really in that perspective, it helps yeah. you cope better and it helps you move on. But it gives you more energy. But eventually at the end of the day, just like what sister at the beginning said, um, Sister Michelle and, and, and the other uh, Vijaya, I think Vijaya, Vijaya right, um, shared the Jinsi aphorism is those aphorisms will come out and affect us and constantly remind us and give us strength. And I think that's the most important thing. You gain the most, not because you gain the wisdom, but you gain that seeds in you so that when you hit the challenge, it's going to come right back up. So thank you all for the Jinsi aphorism sharing. Thank you, uh, Brother Kevin. Thank you to, um, to Sister Xiao Jing and all the uh, people effortless, you know, their effort to put in here to make it possible so that we could have week after week review. Next week, um, I think it should be, um, next week we'll, we'll, we'll be back to Hua Lian and I think um, Master, would, uh, Master De Huang would, would share with us. And then uh, as Master's taking the trip around Taiwan, I will be absent, but I'll be with you all in spirit and I'll check in from time to time what's going on. So thank you all so much and stay true, stay sincere, 
and stay healthy and stay good in our path. Thank you. And 